Middle of May in the highlands of Eritrea, 30 years ago exactly, people in these mountains began to fight to free their country from Ethiopia, to them a colonial power. This morning, 200,000 deaths later, the capital city, Asmara, is in sight. Most of these fighters have family, even homes behind the last enemy lines. They aim carefully and pray for a rapid end to the destruction. And then it's over. A generation born and raised under fire can straighten their backs, smile at the blue sky, consider a future. There's relief. Strangers are friendly. And mothers whose children joined the rebels years ago must now wait for news, good or bad. <laughs> to the very last minute, this was a terrible conflict. These pictures were taken by Eritrean camera crews, basically guerrillas aiming lenses instead of gun barrels. Today, we'll tell the story of the uphill effort to bring this horrible war before world opinion. These are pictures of hope and defiance, and there is a Canadian connection. By helping people in need, as we thought, we may have had a hand in delaying this moment in the streets of Asmara. <laughs> On a quiet street in North End, Montreal, a tiny struggling film production company is raising money to go and film the famine. Alter Sini has two partners, Danielle Lacourse and Ivan Patry. They've spent several years filming in Central America. That was easy compared to what's ahead. In Ethiopia, they'll discover that while it's okay to film starving children, there are often times when the government interferes. They're not allowed to visit the homes of Eritreans or even to mention the war. They feel the full story is being kept away from the people back home. I think the, the media didn't explain the causes of famine in that period of time. There were many reports on television and uh, I think the real causes and particularly the fact that there was a war going on that was devastating the agriculture, devastating people, killing and conscripting a lot of youngsters and a very devastating war and it didn't come out. What came out was a call for guilt. That's, what, that's the way I call it. We were getting faceless, voiceless people in a, in a phenomena which uh, you didn't have much of the analysis of what was really going on as the root causes of, 
of the famine. So we, we taught first and foremost that we should hear these people and see what they had to say about what was really going on in the country. You went to Eritrea. What did you find there? Uh, what's interesting in the case of Eritrea, I think, and that is a hope for Ethiopia, for the Horn, and for Africa, is the fact that there were people, particularly in the liberated uh, areas, who were fighting for their independence, it's true, from Ethiopia, but also with the conception of what kind of society they would like, and organizing themselves to realize little by little, to, uh, to, um, uh, to carry on this project, this social project. And we saw that at the level of agriculture, for example. We saw that there were possible uh, actions that they were taking, like, for example, terracing, uh, uh, a reforestation, uh, water projects, where they would try to face all this uh, environmental uh, crisis and the drought, and they would have uh, successes in this particular field. So th there was like a hope there that was interesting to show because we haven't seen it, we hadn't seen that before. <laughs> That was the beginning of a campaign by Le Corse and Patri to get out the other side of the Ethiopia story. They were banned by the regime in Addis Ababa, but they trekked through the Eritrean mountains with the independence movement, trying to get the world to pay attention. <laughs> Their films showed the human tragedy of the war. But the strongest message would be reserved for the efforts of the Eritreans to overcome the misery, such as a pharmaceutical factory dug into the hillside and run by local technicians, or a forge to make farming implements. All of this while total destruction could be only moments away. I think it will be very difficult for Canadians to accept that what they've contributed hasn't been used properly. Our government is a good example of that. I mean, we have forwarded more than $700 million of aid to Ethiopia since 84. $700 million? More than that. I think it's 730, but I'm not sure. It's more. And basically, no questions asked to the Ethiopian government on how this food was delivered, where it was delivered. Sure, we had monitoring, but in a very, very uh, superficial manner. So therefore, we are not, even if we, we have a, a general intention, good intention of, of delivering food to the most needy, we have no local expertise, we have no local no background logistics to do it. I think it saved lives. It's important to say that. And it's important to say that a part of the aid has gone not through the government, but through NGOs and agencies like the ICRC, for example, that I've seen in Eritrea in 85, 86. That's the International Red Cross. The International Cross. Red Cross was distributing Canadian wheat to the people, and I saw that. It's important to say, to say it uh, openly, and it saved lives. What's happening now is that there was a situation where we didn't really explain to the Canadians what was going on. And the situation of drought and famine is just repeating year after year. And then they discovered that there is a war, and then they discovered that there was a military dictatorship, that the food wasn't reaching through the government channels, wasn't reaching the people. And then they say, well, my God, are we going to give again? You know, what, what's the use? And what are the prospects? And if there is another famine and it's just repeating, there's no hope, you know? I think it's part also of uh, telling the truth to the people. I don't think that hiding the fact that there is a war helps the Ethiopians. Eritrea can be tough terrain. The Ethiopian army never did make much headway in these mountains. It's not that much easier for a North American film crew. 
The final pictures may show a spectacular vista into the valley, but not the cameraman's battered knees. During the latter part of the 1980s, Alter Cine returned regularly to film in Eritrea. Most of the time, travel was by night, a disorienting experience, but relatively safe from the Ethiopian Air Force and its napalm bombs. It might take four or five nights of driving before getting to the location. And in the daytime, there must be no trace of your whereabouts. Any glint of metal will attract the Ethiopian planes. It's a time to stay quiet, conserve energy, and get to know the people you're visiting, to listen to their stories. Those spices come from the Sudan. All the spices Ginger, uh, ginger uh, the main source is Ethiopia. Ethiopia, the dry. Le Corse and Patri produced at least one film a year about Eritrea, but the big media stayed away. A slow-moving, stubborn, hard-to-see conflict among Africans does not make great headlines. But they did find one grateful audience inside Eritrea itself. Now, we do not dream of establishing big hospitals with big laboratories. Our dream is to make sure that... People, the image people had of Ethiopians in general, and they didn't know about Eritrea, so they were talking about Ethiopians, was an image of passive people not being able to help themselves and you know Im images of starvation and they never had a, a positive image of how people can take their destiny in hand. Danielle, how do the Eritreans react when they see these pictures of themselves? And there were two reactions that were very interesting for me. First, it's when they saw the archives of their own history, like we had in the film archives of the United Nations when the United Nations sent the commission to investigate about uh, the, uh, independ the, the sentiment for independence in Eritrea uh, after that the Second World in, War. That was back in the 1950s. Yes, Early and, and uh, the fact that the, 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 the Eritreans were then demonstrating for independence in the streets and uh, Many young people hadn't uh, seen these images, of course, most of them hadn't seen the images. And it was like discovering their own history. And it's an interesting process because they have been cut from this part of their history and now like, they were reappropriating their own uh, memory, in a way. The second reaction was they were asking a lot about what was the reaction of people here. But at least you know to know which number, uh, which uh, shot. The Eritreans were also learning to make their own films. The Liberation Front had been receiving equipment and was beginning to train its own people, often with the help of Alter Sine or other foreigners. Video technology can be very complex. But when necessary, it can be made simple. The point was to cover the war in a way no foreigner could. And when the moment came, it paid off. Tonight, dramatic footage of the Ethiopian army's grim path of destruction through its rebellious northern province of Eritrea. A report from the front lines tonight. This is ABC News Nightline, reporting from Washington. In early 1990, the Eritreans captured the port city of Misawa. In response, the Ethiopian Air Force used cluster bombs against the civilian population. Eritrean cameramen were in the middle of the massacre. Alter Sine got their tapes to the networks. It was headline material. To Patrido, it was more than that. Filming these 
these cluster bombs in central places and following the victims and, and literally doing what is very difficult to do these days, having a war cameraman on the front lines from the point of view of the victim, which, which we didn't see in the Iraq war, of course, but I mean, <laughs> uh, which was really happening. And these guys really managed to create an important, uh, an important... Uh, it's an important statement about war and its devastation. Mm -hmm. To see a young kid completely devastated by shrapnel, talking to his brother and asking, this kid is about seven years old, and asking him, you know, are they going to bury us right away? And the brother answering, no, we might be able to go to the hospital. The smoke was just clearing when the Alter Cine crew arrived in Basawa. Words like victory or liberation don't make much sense amid scenes like these. A once prosperous and beautiful city became a graveyard for people on both sides. La Corse and Patry rushed home to make sure the pictures had their effect. These images have been shown on different uh, networks in the States, in uh, England, in Canada, and they have been shown also to uh, members of the U.S. Congress. And they were put on air in the States just before the arrival of uh, Gorbachev, for the summit uh, Bush-Gorbachev. And uh, there was a resolution at the end of the summit where the two, uh, the, the Soviet Union and the States were asking for a negotiating uh, process in Ethiopia and were putting pressure for peace and asked the government to stop the bombings. And the bombing stopped during five months. Okay. And I think it's partly because these images that the Eritreans have taken of the bombings have shaken. I I wouldn't say the world, but uh, they have shaken the, the public and uh, the persons who were involved in uh, making the politics. The guns have fallen silent in Eritrea. The next generation may not have to grow up to be soldiers. This equipment may become irrelevant. The UN agencies, were they a help or a hindrance? The UN, because it's on a government-to-government -government basis, so how can you acknowledge feeding one side of the war and not feeding the other side? And how can you have an independent uh, audit? How can you have an independent monitoring? I, I feel that in, partly we fed the Ethiopian army, and also partly we fed the rebels. So if we want to do a good job, the system has to be worked out so that we have direct access below and above the lines and have access to the population. And you can't do this in an area where you have warring parties if you don't do it to independent sources. When you say, we fed the Ethiopian army, it really means that we contributed to a, to a prolongation of the war. That's why the system has to be revisited and, and changed, because we, there are still 30 or some wars going on, there are still conflicts, there are still internal refugees, and yeah. these people are, are the people that are the most vulnerable. So therefore, to reach them, we have to do it on an independent basis, we have to go beyond the warring factions and do it. The situation yeah. in Somalia today and the situation in, some, in Sudan is the same thing as it was in Ethiopia two years ago. And I, I, I would add something. I think it's important in a situation where uh, there is a war in a country and like 60% of the national budget was going for war. I think it's important that the countries, the donators, the donors, just don't give food uh, like this without any condition. I don't want to say that they should blackmail, but I think that there should be pressure exercise in order to get peace as soon as possible. And it hasn't been done. In Eritrea, though, all eyes are on the future. The people of Asmara turn out by the thousands to welcome home the first group of exiles on a charter from the United States. No 
one seems to know just who'll be on board. Just as the travelers aren't sure who's left to greet them. A sister and a brother, separated and without news for 10 years. And an Eritrean born in America, confused now by this new country she's been told is hers. For her, hopefully, war and famine will exist only in the stories she'll hear from others. Thank you. 